not just a World War II story, though it is the greatest World War II TV series ever made and the longest running, but it works because it's a human drama. It looks at the men and the women involved in the war. The World War II is really pretty much a setting for the internal dramas of the men and women. And it works today because the stories are timeless. It deals with right and wrong. We knew it was special. Actors wanted to be on it. Directors wanted to direct it. And it was Selmer Productions because of Selig Seligman and his wife Muriel Seligman. That's where the Selmer came from. One reason that he was given the shot, he was uh, related to the president of ABC at the time. That helped a lot. Seligman was a great producer. Uh, he brought a lot of talent to the show, but he basically let the show run its course. He did not have a lot of day-to-day um, -day influence on a show. Well, there was a bit of a conflict between the producers of the show at the beginning. Robert Lees and Robert Altman both, they really wanted an anthology feel to the show, so they would create some great episodes that featured individual members of the squad. However, Selig Seligman, the producer, he really wanted squad stories. So for the time that Altman and Lees were with the show during the first season, it really had that anthology feel. So you've got some great episodes out of that, like Any Second Now, also Survival, and Escape to Nowhere. But later on, when those people weren't associated with it, you got the more cast feelings, like the Burt Kennedy episodes, where the squad and the interaction among the cast, that was really what kept the show together. Two rounds, one clip. Lieutenant? Divide it up more evenly. Make every shot count. A lot of times, the actual producers uh, would get with the writers and develop the concepts themselves. It was very much uh, a director's show for the first couple of um, episodes, especially with Robert Altman, who would really put his stamp of individuality on every show. And the same with Bert Kennedy. He would put the individual stamp on the show. And Consequently, the show of the first season was a little disjointed because you didn't have any single vision of the show. And even the actors were developing their characters as they went along. Vic Morrow. What do you say about Vic Morrow? Not much you can say because he's, he's gone and in the most wasted death of any human being I've ever known, or at least one of them. Uh, Vic was a truly a good friend, uh, a wonderful guy to work with, a great actor, a very giving actor, a very selfless actor which is a rare thing to say about actors in any time, then or now, and uh, kind of guy that you look forward to going work with, to work with the next morning. A lot, of, a lot of actors in your life, you can't wait till the day is over. With Vic, you look forward to him the next day. I was just always kind of in awe of Vic because, I mean, being the young kid, uh, he, was, he, was a, uh, he was an actor that I, I envied his talent and his, his, work, his work ethic. Vic Morrow. He was quite a guy, uh, and quite an actor. Uh, I first met Vic when I came onto the series Combat, and the first episode we directed. And after the first day, he came to me after we'd wrapped, and he said, you're the first breath of fresh air that's come in here since Bob Altman. And I'll never forget Vic telling me that. And. Uh, he was a breath of fresh air to me, too, because you don't get many actors the caliber of a Vic Morrow to work with on a television series. I remember uh, once I asked him, you know, stupid question, but I said, uh, what's it feel like to be a star? And he said, uh, I'm not a star, I'm a comet. And I will flame out before my time. Prophetic. Rick Jason, he was a very... Uh, very professional actor, he always knew his words. I was on one show with him where he had 104 temperature, just like Vic did on shows. Always showed up, always did what he had to do. He was extremely good with weapons. He was a hunter. 
So he always looked very good firing his carbine. He looked like a soldier. He was excellent. He had, he had good authority. Uh, he was the star of the show in the first couple of shows, and then Vic took over being the star. And they alternated. He had a great sense of humor and a great storyteller. I do remember it was the kind of thing you'd, you're ready to roll, and in those days you had to roll, and he had this story coming up, and uh, you hung on to the story because he really enjoyed it. I, I, I liked him. Rick Jason was the kind of man that you felt was the most secure in the world, and as you would see him as the lieutenant on combat, uh, that's exactly the way he was in person, except if you were alone with Rick. He became more introverted and quiet. In other words, I guess what I'm saying is when he was with people, he was always on. He was always acting. But a nice man. And uh, I, I think he was a very insecure guy. While we were doing the, the pilot, I said, why am I in your story? Basic question. And he said, well, Pierre, I'll tell you why. Uh, you're an occasion, you're a Cajun, the character. When I was in Europe, I had two Acadian Cahoon soldiers. They were the best killer in the outfit, and they never spoke too much. They did their duty. I said, thank you very much. The colonel that was on the show, one of the colonels, said he was the fastest man to reload an M1 of anybody. I mean, it was literally a fraction of a second he'd get that thing out in the the clip was back in. The clip pops out, the clip goes back in. It was amazing, and he was quick. He was just, he was just like a cat, you know. And he, he was excellent. He was great for the show. During the time we were doing the pilot, we were having lunch, and uh, Vic said to me, uh, you know, without malice, but with uh, a smile, he said, you're really not an actor, are you, Pierre? I said, no, I, I am not a professional actor like you, but I am a technician. And I happened to know the business. And so we spoke. And uh, after a while, he said, well, that's interesting. He said, because, you know, I hope that if the series continues, uh, or survive, I hope to be able to someday direct a few episodes. And so I said to him, I said, well, that's interesting. Why don't we exchange knowledge? <laughs> so he looked at me, and he said, that's fine. So from that time on, uh, we had a sort of a good reputation or relationship, and and uh, he really became my my acting teacher. You know, ABC was not a great network at the time. It was a struggling network, and it didn't pay very much. Shecky Green was a top Las Vegas act. He made a ton of money, and whenever he did a combat episode. He took a financial hit because he couldn't be working in Vegas at the time. And he said, what am I doing here? I can be in Vegas making more money. And he walked into Altman's office and said goodbye. I loved playing soldier because you could get down and dirty and, uh, and, and get paid for it. What better lifestyle was that? Um, uh, my, uh, uh, my agent uh, said at one point uh, at, after the first season had concluded that she never could really tell who I was because all you guys look alike in those helmets and those uniforms except she said I could always tell you Tom because you're the one with a fat ass going over the fence. Dick Peabody, this great big hulking fellow with that fabulously deep voice, um, you just loved him when you first met him, hello. He shook hands with you and your hand disappeared. He was an announcer in Utah or someplace. He worked for radio. So he had a great voice. So I'm holding this hand grenade and supposedly can't find the pin, and that's because Little John has found it and hidden it from me uh, to try and get me in deeper trouble, which he always tried to do. Um, anyway, so when finally at the conclusion of the scene, he is to take the pin and try and put it back into the grenade handle. And he put it in there, and he had such difficulty, if you read his lips closely, you can hear him say, son of a bitch. And he finally got it into the hole, and that ended the scene, and the crew cracked up. Steve Rogers is kind of a mystery. First of all, his name was not Stephen Rogers, it was Rick Rogers. And because they already had Rick Jason as a star, they decided that he really ought to change his first name to be on the show. So he became, at that point, Steve Rogers. Jack Hogan is an excellent actor. 
the man, there isn't a thing he would not do, no matter how tough the assignment, especially when the character was underwritten. He was able to fix it and fix it in his inimitable way so as to really produce a three-dimensional character. I must say the entire cast was really uh, very pleasant to work with and, and they were very welcoming. Gene Levitt, who saw something in a show I had done that was directed by Bert Kennedy, who was a very wonderful director, a very nice man and a very good director, very encouraging. And after that episode, I think Gene Levitt and the producers called me in and asked if I would like to guest star as a sniper. And of course, that was an enormous feeling of accomplishment. I mean, wow. It was also interesting not to be in, an, in a Nazi uniform, which I was getting tired of, to be frank with you. I must say, the, from the production staff on down, people in combat were very nice, uh, starting with the executive producer and ending with the cast. And um, I had nothing but fond memories. Metro Goldwyn Mayer. You're a kid. You're a kid and you come to LA and you are directing television and an opportunity to direct television. And one day you're hired to direct a, a, a television show and you go to Metro Goldwyn Mayer and they let you on the lot and they say, Oh, you're the director? I mean, what else can happen to you in your life? You've accomplished everything. It was still a going studio, but it was losing money. It was, I guess you would call, the, the ultimate studio as far as the resources you had to work with. And it was a joy because all you had to do was ask for something and it was there. The studio was still fully functioning. They actually had crews that sat around and did nothing. They shot in six days. And they had a budget, I believe first season it was $125,000 an episode which wouldn't even buy you one explosion nowadays. And they did incredible work uh, with that budget. The days were long, they were 14 hour days by the time you got to the studio and by the time you got home. But um, it, was, it was worth it. I mean, at the end of the day, you felt great. Thank heaven they all were on time, basically, or we would never have gotten the show done. First ADs were superb. That made your job easier. They knew exactly what, what was, where you were going and what was there to, already prepared for you. They, they, everything was laid out perfectly. They were way ahead of everybody. They were wonderful. Robert Bob Hauser, Robert Bob Hauser, one of the great, great, um, in those days, black and white cameramen. His camera operator, Cy, uh, I mean, they did, they would roll down the hill with the handheld cameras. They would do everything with it. And uh, yes, Sutton liked the handheld look because it uh, was similar to the footage, the action footage that we uh, used as stock footage from World War II. He was in complete control and very much supportive of the director. I know he was supportive of me. Anything that uh, I required of him, which was rather difficult at times and rather complicated, there wasn't a murmur that came out of Bob. Bob just did it and did it as best as he could, and the results were top. Concerning the stuntmen on combat, uh, we didn't have stuntmen as such. You would have the same stunt people play both the Germans and the Americans. So they'd have them in one uniform in the morning and then they'd change nationalities after lunch break and they'd be filming themselves, shooting themselves. And they didn't always edit that in too well, so sometimes you actually saw it was the same guy shooting himself. Earl Parker was hired to double Vic. And Angie DeMeo was a stand-in. But oh, what a talent. And between the two, they could do anything. We had Angie shooting himself. He would, he would be a GI with a little darkness here and a darkness here and a helmet on. Maybe a little touch of a rough, rough beard. And then he, here he was the Nazi, the German, with a German helmet on. So that he could do, and he had this amazing body control, Angie did. When, you know, when they were shot, they didn't do all the goofy things. They just dropped. Whenever they were shot, if you watch them, boy, it was just boom. They had an incredible safety record on combat. There were no major accidents that I know of. There was one, actually the, the only one accident that I know of uh, didn't happen first season. That was uh, a shot where the uh, cameraman 
went over uh, one of the pots as it exploded. He got knocked off of the chair. And even then, he wasn't seriously hurt. It was really an admirable record they had of safety. Well, he had people in jeopardy, but never in danger. Far from the brave, yeah, because we had to make a long run uh, across the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the French street uh, to the Brit, toward the bridge, and there were pots set up all over the street. And it was my first experience with large explosives. I got out there, and as we did the first take, which I believe they printed, and that's what we used, the first pot, I got so close to it, it blew my helmet off. We didn't, you know, tie the chin straps down. <clears throat> and so as I went by, the concussion just literally blew it off my head. And I had to run over, grab it quickly, and put it back on. But by that time, you know, my eyes were filled with all that dust that comes out of that thing, too. And I wore contact lenses at the time. Oh, it was like somebody just stuck daggers in my eyes. Again, that is so carefully set up. Your special effects people. Now, of course, people think it's all done with computers, but in those days, you had guys who dug the hole, put the charge in, ran the wire, and hit the battery. And the safety of these special effects men and their concern for the safety of the actors was phenomenal. at Republic for four years with the Lidecker brothers, uh, Babe and Theodore Lidecker. They, they were the special effects men at Republic. And I learned a lot of respect for what they did and the art with which they did it. And then I got to work with Flowers on combat. And he was precision itself. He knew exactly if he was firing a squib at you to go off beside you, he knew exactly where that was going to go. Well, are you going to help me blow out that gun or not? As far as makeup goes, there was one makeup man, John Truy. There weren't 12 or six. or uh, On any other show, you would have had four or five. John Truy did them all. He made up everybody at MGM for years and years. You know, from Elizabeth Taylor to, I mean, they wouldn't have anybody else. So they had to fight over it. His approach he didn't take snapshots. He made little diagrams of actors. And what that did was, what you did on the first day of the show, you had an actor that came in that had the black under here and the black here and something here and maybe a little mustache on. He would draw that in a little sketch. He'd keep that sketch. And then in day four, here comes that actor back. Ten minutes, he was ready. Unbelievable. As a matter of fact, the thing I loved about working for ABC, ABC had a, their number was Norton, N-O-3-3-3-1-1, and they had a tie line to New York. And I remember calling in and say, hello, is the tie line open? And the lady would say, yes. I said, well, this is Donna from Combat. She said, oh, yes, sir. And she had no idea who I was. And I would call all my friends in New York free on the tie line. It was a, ABC was good to us, and they didn't know it. When I, uh came in there, I knew that I was going to be the guest star for that episode, period. I also read the script. I knew I got killed in it. And for a while there, it really kind of hurt because I didn't want to get killed. I kind of would love to have been able to stay around with these guys. Most of the time, we'd go hang out with each other at the, at the local bar afterwards, so we knew it was a family then. All I can tell you is that those five years ago, I couldn't wait to go to work in the morning get up at five, get in the car, nobody, the streets are empty, it's California, I'm going to work at MGM, you know, I mean, what the hell? Everybody in the world is dreaming of that. To have been a part of something like this, uh, I mean, when you're doing it, you never think that anything's going to last this long. Um, and most especially, um, the reaction of fans, the reaction of people. I get letters still in the past few years from women and which is fascinating is that all of them say that thanks to combat I've learned to love my father because they were young and he was a soldier and they, you know not many soldiers who live the real soldier talk about it so by watching combat with their father he began to talk it was very impressive. I was, I, the whole show impressed me. The writing, 
the direction, uh, uh, the, the, the acting of not only the regulars in the show, but the guest stars. It was quite an experience. The best episodes really showed men struggling for their moral core and their moral center. All the citizen soldiers of World War II, these were, these were your neighbors who became heroes, not because they wanted to, but because they had to do a job. Same with firemen and the policemen of today. These are the people you want to know because people who you can trust with your lives. One of my dear friends, Cornelius Ryan, who wrote The Longest Day, The Last Battle, was the youngest correspondent of World War II. He was a fan of the show at the time. He liked it because it showed, again, the GI in the dirt, not just the big battles, you know, the overall pictures from the air. And it was showed the GI in the trench, actually going what he was going through. And so the combat episodes, why they are still relevant today is because it answers those basic moral questions and how you deal with right and wrong. I think that's why the stories will be timeless for decades to come.